Thomists, SCOTUS, Charismatics. Oh my. Brother of Christ, Laudato Jesus Christus in Sequila. This is Timothy Flanders, and this is the Guild Family Stream. Happy Pentecost Friday, everybody. Hope you're all doing well. This is an offering of gratitude to all the Guild members. Your financial and prayerful support helps the Flanders family have the income necessary for all the mouths I had to feed and the bills I have to pay. And allows me to, our whole family, to be together at home because I can work from home. My wife can be a full-time mom. So thank you for all of your support. As usual, we will release the first 10, 15 minutes of this whole broadcast to the public to promote the Guild. If you want access to the entire presentation, you got to go to mediumcatholic.com slash register. Join the Guild. And we only ask that you offer something, you chip in something to the pot, and you also invoke our patrons every single day, our lay patrons. This is a lay apostolate, and we're trying to operate this lay apostolate only as lay people, according to our Our Lady of Victory constitution. We're trying to operate just as lay people, not as theologians. So what I'm going to do in line with that, we're trying, I'm going to try to summarize what the clerical theologians have said on this and operating it as a layman according to the traditional doctrine of lay nobility. Lay nobility traditionally is an office of rulership in the church, which operates for the common good of the faithful, especially in the temporal sphere, not in the theological sphere, The lay nobility is not trying to resolve theological difficulties. That's the job of the clerics and the theologians. It's not my job. What I'm going to try to do here is I'm going to try to summarize what these theologians have been doing, especially in regards to a dubium that has been created in our day by the charismatic movement Uh, in their assertion about the charismatic gifts, these miraculous gifts of the Holy Ghost, especially speaking in tongues. So we'll talk a little bit about that today and uh, any of your questions and comments. So we'll discuss those. So let us begin the Catholic doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So the, so yeah, this is what we'd be going over through. What are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? What is the Catholic doctrine thereof? And what do we make of this charismatic movement? What is the church teaching? What is the theological note of the Thomistic doctrine? Now, the meaning of Catholic does not mean universal. Universal is an aspect of the the definition, but etymologically speaking, the Greek of Catholic is kata holon. Kata means according to, holon means the whole thing, according to the whole. And what I'm going to argue here is that the Thomistic doctrine is often confused with the Catholic doctrine. And unfortunately, Thomists themselves sometimes perpetuate this. But it, this is in particularly disastrous in regards to the Filioque. Um, but in regards to the doctrine of the gifts, there is, it, it seems that St. Thomas does have a leg above some of these other doctrines. But it, it, I would still not, that would not be considered Catholic doctrine per se. Uh, so we'll talk about that. And then I'm going to argue that the Catholic stance toward both the Thomistic doctrine and the charismatic is a moderating synthesis. In short, there are truths, I think. There are truths, even in the spiritual life, that the charismatic movement has. But there are also excesses. So we'll talk about that. As usual, at Meaning of Catholic, our our job is to restore the rival schools of Christendom. That's how we unite Catholics against the enemy of the Holy Church. Again, act, operating in that, that sense of lay nobility, where the lay nobility, uh, the primordial, primordial, primordial model thereof is 
Emperor St. Constantine the Great, who's a layman, and his job is to get all the theologians together to work out the crisis. And he might have some uh, suggestion as to what might resolve the crisis, but it's not his job. His job is to get the theologians together. So what we're doing here is we're getting the theologians together. So first, before we get into that, let's get into the best guild member comments. Sherry says, I just got my first, are you sure you want to post this comment warning on YouTube? I had to change Mohammedans to those who Belloc called heretics outside the church. Catholic achievement level unlocked. What's the jingle for that? Uh, we'll have to add a, uh, create a jingle out of that. We'll, let's get to work on that. Anthony Abate says, we, we were discussing the um, working on Sunday issue. And um, essentially, you shouldn't work on Sunday. That's that's a part of the third commandment. You shouldn't work on Sunday. Unfortunately, that's pretty common that people work on Sunday. People buy things on Sunday. Pretty much people go Catholics go to mass on Sunday, but they pretty much do everything else they would have done on any other day besides go to mass, which is not Catholic doctrine. That's contrary to the third commandment. We need to stop working on 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 Sunday. We need to stop buying things on Sunday. We need to restore Sunday to obeying the third commandment. You know, this is the third commandment. It's a pretty huge commandment. However, some people can go overboard with that because there are exceptions to the third commandment. There always has been. As our Lord said, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. There are people who can imitate the Pharisees and the way that the Pharisees critiqued our Lord for healing a man on the Sabbath. What an insane thing to do. And unfortunately, there are still Catholic Pharisees out there who are going to do things like this. Here's Anthony Bate. He says this, quote, I got told I was in grave sin for working on my Marian garden on a Sunday by an anonymous Twitter user. I think he excommunicated me. Pretty sure only the Pope can lift the penalty, end quote. Yes, yeah, so unfortunately, uh, as Catholics, we do have to watch out for the, the Twitter popes because they are out there. And, uh, you know, we always want to stay in communion with the, the Twitter popes, especially the anonymous ones who are don't even have names. Um, so the anonymous Twitter popes and the YouTube popes and the social media popes who in excommunicate, we should always maintain communion with those anonymous popes that we don't even know who they are, where they are, or who gave them the authority. Uh, you and what army, I guess, uh, is what we say to these uh, anonymous Twitter popes. So, but yeah, if you have been excommunicated by an anonymous Twitter pope, uh, be sure to uh, do penance and, um, you know, put on sackcloth and all that fun stuff so that he can lift that excommunication because he's the only one who can lift that. So, Public service announcement. All right. So let's get into the Holy Spirit. I think that the there's a, a great way to start this whole discussion by quoting from the Roman Catechism because it really is a beautiful, um, a, a beautiful and wonderful way to begin this. Um, side note. Oh, you know what? Oh, I left it upstairs. But just a promotion right here on my left side here is the Tradivox series. And I was just um, I was reading from the Tradivox series of the Roman Catechism. It's very, very good. Um, it's a it's just such a great addition. It's pre I mean, it's one of the best editions of the Roman Catechism out there that you can buy. Besides the fact that Roman the Tradivox series has all these other catechisms available. So shout out to my friend Aaron Sang for your great work over at Tradivox. So here's what the Roman Catechism says. On this article, the article, I believe, in the Holy Ghost from the Apostles' Creed, he says this, the Roman Catechism. On this article of the Holy Spirit, no less than on those that preceded, ignorance or error would be unpardonable in a Christian. Hence, the whole apostle did not permit some among the Ephesians to remain in ignorance with regard to the person of the Holy Ghost, 
having asked if they had received the Holy Ghost and having received for an answer that they had, did not so much as know that there was a Holy Ghost, he at once demanded, in whom therefore were you baptized? To signify that a distinct knowledge of this article is most necessary to the faithful. For such knowledge they derive special fruit. For considering attentively that whatever they have, they possess through the bounty and beneficence of the Holy Spirit, they begin to think more modestly and humbly of themselves and to place all their hope in the protection of God, which for a Christian is the first step towards consummate wisdom and supreme happiness. So I, I think that this is a, a perfect way to start because we are going to talk about the dangers of pride regarding the Holy Spirit. And this is in particular remedied by this consideration that whatever good I have in my life is from the Holy Spirit. Whatever good I have in my spiritual life is an act of the Holy Spirit. The Nicene Creed that says that the Holy Spirit is the life giver. And uh, this seems to be a good summary of the whole doctrine of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is the unseen mystery animating all natural and supernatural life. He is the life giver. As we see in the very beginning of creation, the world was formless and void, but the Spirit hovered over the deep. And then the Lord speaks. And this is the, the new catechism brings this out beautifully, that God the Father speaks the word, let there be light. And the word requires his breath. And so the action of the Logos, in the beginning was the Logos, and through him was made all things, it has a corresponding action of the Holy Spirit. And we see this also in the entire life of our Lord. The incarnation, he was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. And so the, the incarnation itself is an action of the Holy Spirit. All natural and supernatural life is this unseen mystery animating, animated by the Holy Spirit. Yet, this is a great mystery. And I, as I researched this for this presentation, I felt totally inadequate to even start to contemplate this and try to teach it. Um, so on the one hand, it's, a, it's, it's really um, such an important consideration, as the Roman Catechism tells us. And we need to consider that, and that keeps us from pride. Humility forces us to conform ourselves to the truth, as St. Thomas says. So if there's something good in us, we should recognize it. Yes, I, I'm, I have a, a skill in this area or a talent in this area or whatever, or I've overcome this sin. Well, so what? Because that's the Holy Spirit's work. Yes, there's good, but it's the Holy Spirit. Yet this is a great mystery. And we talk about these different uh, doctrines. I'm really not going to be able to scratch the surface on some of this mysterious stuff. Uh, and as I said, I'm not trying to be a theologian either. I'm just trying to present the kata holon. But one thing I do want to emphasize is this. Is that the heart is the spiritual center of every person. Heart speaks to heart, as Newman said. And this is this is in um, two weeks. So next week is Friday. So next week's stream, we'll talk about Corpus Christi because that's Friday within the octave of Corpus Christi. And then the Friday after that is Sacred Heart. And so we'll be doing. I'll be doing a presentation for the Guild stream on this book by Dietrich von Hildebrand, The Heart. And I've been very, very moved by this text because it really seeks to restore a a metaphysical conversation that is rooted in the Holy Scripture. There is a lot of conversation among Catholic authors about the intellect, the will, and the passions. And if this can be, if this is excessive to the neglect of the heart, then this is contrary to scripture and the words of the liturgy, which we'll discuss in a minute. Sursum corda. 
Sursum corda means lift up your hearts. Obviously, you're lifting up your intellect and lifting up your will, and you're also subduing your passion. Obviously, those are connected. But the Sursum corda says to lift up your hearts. That is the exhortation in the uh, at the preface. And so it's a lifting up of one's hearts. This is really the, this is the action. I mean, this is another way we could sum up the action of the Holy Spirit is that it, the Holy Spirit lifts up our hearts because we cannot lift them on our own. It is the Holy Spirit. He is the one who lifts up our hearts. And one thing that Hildebrand points out in this text is that he, he points out that the Greek notion, so uh, the, coming out of Aristotle and other Greeks, is that they just had really had no appreciation for the heart. Where, whereas when you read the Holy Scripture, you see that the heart is emphasized pretty much more than any other thing in man. It's always about the heart. There's very little talk about, if at all, about the intellect, will, and passions. Those are Greek distinctions. But in the Holy Scriptures, in the, in the Hebrew Scriptures, it's about the heart. There's always this conversation about the heart. And Obviously, we see that right after the Protestant revolt happens, we have the, the revelation of the sacred heart. So all of this to say that the Holy Spirit is especially associated with charity, which is associated, especially associated with the heart. Now, I want to read this lit litur liturgical um, piece here from... The post-communion on Pentecost Thursday, it, it speaks about, I mean, this really comes at the, the, the what seems to be the greatest miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit, which is to cleanse our hearts from sin and fill those hearts, and thus our entire personhood, if the heart is indeed this spiritual center of man, as the scriptures indicate, with the divine life. And this is beautifully expressed in, in all sorts of passages of Holy Scripture, but I came across this Pope's communion this week, Pentecost Thursday. May the infusion of the Holy Spirit cleanse our hearts, O Lord, and make them fruitful inwardly by his dew watering them. And this makes mention of the fact that there's all these different scriptural symbols of the Holy Spirit that are created, that God created these in the natural world, and they become symbols of the Holy Spirit. And this is the, the water symbol. There's obviously fire, the dove, um, wind. Um, but there is this, the depth of the human heart is a great mystery. It's something that married people know quite well, because when you're married, you give your heart to each other, and then you spend the rest of your life entering into the mystery of that person's heart and your spouse's heart into you. And that's a great mystery, but the Holy Spirit goes deeper than anything, any anything can go. The Holy Spirit dives in the depths of our hearts. And this is the most miraculous thing one can imagine. So when we talk about the charismatic gifts and these things like speaking in tongues are miraculous, miraculous things, those are insignificant compared to the Holy Spirit cleansing our hearts and the depths of that mystery of the human heart. In particular, as I said, the, the, the Holy Spirit is associated chiefly with charity. And we point out that the Holy Spirit is called the consoler. And you can, you can read this. He is called the, the best, the cons consolator optime in the Veni Sancte Spiritus sequence that is prayed every single day in Pentecost week. And two of his fruits are joy and peace. This is what Hildebrand points out. Joy and peace, joy and peace of the spiritual of the Holy Ghost are movements of the heart. They are affections. It, it's I don't think it's fitting to call them really emotions because they're not merely just an emotion. Like you have a, you know, an emotion flare up, you get angry or whatever. That's a very, it's kind of a base passion. But the higher spiritual 
realm of the heart that the Holy Spirit brings us to is ultimately this joy and peace, which is all, this is all the fruit of this charity and charity. Um, and St. Thomas has a great doctrine on the fact that wisdom is the fruit of charity, which is union with God. And that God, as St. Paul says, God has poured out his love in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And that is the, this, this is the miraculous gift of the Holy Ghost is, is pouring, is, is writing, writing the new law on our hearts. That's the miraculous gift. Because the old law was written on tables of stone. And the miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit is writing the law on our hearts through the charity of the Holy Ghost. It's not as flashy as speaking in tongues or having a fire come out of your back. That's not, you know, it's not as flashy, but it's far more miraculous. It's infinitely more miraculous than that and more glorious. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But first, let's talk about uh, Greek and Latin doctrines because the doctrine of the holy spirit was one of the central controversies perhaps the most central controversy in the infamous greek and Latin schism um but the phronima patrum the uh the mind of the fathers is really one 